I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion with Dr. Lisa Leff and Dr. Eddie Portnoy, unpacking the story of Zoza Tchaikovsky, also known as the Archive Thief. Tchaikovsky was a prodigious and complicated French Jewish historian who systematically pillaged libraries and archives in Europe in order to save the documents they contained and then shipped his plunder to new libraries and archives, including YIVO right here in New York. Tchaikovsky's fascinating story was the subject of Lisa Leff's 2015 book, The Archive Thief, The Man Who Salvaged French Jewish History in the Wake of the Holocaust, which we strongly recommend if you haven't read it, or some of you may have, and that could be what brought you here today. We're revisiting the story now, both because it's one of timeless interest and importance and also because it's particularly relevant today with so many questions in our public consciousness about who gets to own and tell historical narratives and how they should do so. In addition to being the author of The Archive Thief, Dr. Lisa Leff is the director of the Jack, Joseph, and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. She's also a professor of history at American University and past president of the Society for French Historical Studies. Lisa's in conversation today with Dr. Eddie Portnoy, who serves as academic advisor and exhibitions curator at YIVO. His articles on Jewish history and pop culture have appeared in the Drama Review, Poland, and Studies in Contemporary Jewry, among other publications. Eddie is also the author of Bad Rabbi and Other Strange But True Stories from the Yiddish Press, published by Stanford University Press in 2017. We're grateful to SNCF America for generously supporting today's program and all of our work at the Museum of Jewish Heritage to preserve the history and lessons of the Holocaust. As Lisa and Eddie discuss Tchaikovsky's story today, please feel free to share your audience questions in the Zoom Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can towards the end of the hour. Without further ado, welcome to you both. Eddie, feel free to get us started. Thanks so much, Ari, uh, and thanks, Lisa, for being here. Um, as Ari uh, told us in his brief uh, but cogent introduction. Um, we'll be talking uh, about uh, Lisa's book, The Archives Thief, uh, which focuses on a man by the name of Zosia Tchaikovsky, uh, whose name may not be familiar to many of you, but uh, if you're like me and you work at YIVO, uh, you may be very familiar with his name because his fingerprints are all over the archives here. Um, now, he's an incredibly fascinating character, uh, and uh, I happened to find uh, the introduction to an article uh, written for a new 2007 uh, photographic exhibition at the International Center for Photography that uses Zosia Tchaikovsky as a hook. And uh, I just wanted to read it because I thought it was a good way to introduce him, uh, or at least pique people's interest about him. It's written by William Meyer. Uh, he writes, when my wife began research 35 years ago for her book on the history of Yiddish theater, she spent long days at YIVO, the, the Institute for Jewish Research. Zosa Tchaikovsky was an entrenched presence there, a gnome-like man with a talent for instantly alienating almost everyone he came into contact with. But this diminutive bundle of spite had led an, an adventurous life. So I think that to a certain degree, in a certain way encapsulates Zosia Tchaikovsky. So I just want to let, ask Lisa if you'll, um, if you'll sort of give us an, an, an introduction to this man and uh, you know, explain who, who we're dealing with here. Thanks, Eddie. And I'm thrilled to be in conversation with you in particular as author of Bad Rabbi. I feel like we're drawn to the same types of stories. Um, Tchaikovsky was a historian and an archivist uh, who worked in times where, where someone who wanted to work on uh, Jews could not probably not make a career in the academy. And that's a lot of why he also, in addition to his work as a historian, became an archive thief who stole um, tens of thousands of documents from archives and libraries in France and moved them uh, to New York, where he was based after the war and sold them bit by bit to Jewish research libraries um, across America, where you can now find them. So he specialized in the history of Jews in France, uh, in, both in terms of his scholarship and in terms of most of what he stole. He stole from France. 
and sold around the United States. So this has left us with quite a legacy, right? He's both one of the most prolific scholars we've ever had doing academic work on Jews in France. He was like the author of something like 200 works of scholarship um, that all used primary sources, mostly things that no one had ever used before. But he's also responsible for so much stuff that should be in France in the archives about the history of Jews being in New York, Cincinnati, Boston, and Israel. Uh, he created a global, what I call a diaspora of documents um, that we have to now consult if we want to study the history of Jews in modern France. Right, I think diaspora of documents is a very really apt apt description of, of what he created. Uh, and it resonates well with his own experience. Um, and so, you know, can you give us some, you know, a beat, brief biographical sketch of, of, you know, where he came from and how he made it to where he was or where he ended up? Yeah. Um, by the way, I, I love that you found that article. Um, I think I ran across it myself when I was doing my research. I love the expression bundle of spite and, um, and I, I myself started working on this project like around, I don't know, 2006 or something. And most of the people I met who knew Tchaikovsky, Tchaikovsky died in 1978. Most of the people I met who knew him, met him in the 1970s. And that includes Meyer who wrote that article and his wife. Um, and it also includes many of my mentors because um, Professors who work on Jews today, who are the most senior, the people who would have been my teachers in the 1990s, they were doing their dissertations in the 70s. And many of them were working at YIVO and that's where Tchaikovsky worked. So they all remember him just like that article does as a bundle of spite, a gnome-like man sitting in the corner making fun of people. And if someone walked into the room seeming like an outsider as um, Meyer's wife, did, um, he would befriend them just to annoy all those um, more serious Yiddishists who also frequented YIVO. So it was very, I had this picture of him as this very difficult man, very much on the outside and angry and a kind of a misfit, though always recognized as highly accomplished. And what I was surprised to find out was that was not always the case. When I encountered what he was like as a younger man, his whole demeanor was very different. Um, he was born in Poland in 1911. Um, and, you know, short, World War I tore apart the village that he was from. And he, as a young man, as a teenager, made his way to Warsaw, and then not that long after, to Paris. When he arrived in Paris, he somehow found his way into the world of Jewish historians. And it was there that he kind of got the passion for Jewish history uh, in the 1930s. And maybe I'll stop there. Okay, um, I just want to point out to people, if you have questions, please uh, put them in the Q&A section not in the chat um and we'll get to your we'll, we'll we should have time at the end to get to your questions um so uh you just stopped in paris where he um you know somehow got involved with historians uh you know according to your book he became a journalist in the yiddish press uh now this is you know to a certain degree it's a, it's it's astounding because here's really a kid. He's a teenager when he gets to Paris. And he uh, has come from, you know, an impoverished town, uh, you know, an impoverished shtetl in, in Poland. And uh, he winds up in this big cosmopolitan European city where, you know, as a teenager, he becomes a journalist. And he has no schooling outside of Cheder uh, and, you know, maybe a bit of, you know, yeshiva. Uh, uh, or maybe I think he did go to uh, uh, a Yiddish, a, like a Yiddish secular school. He didn't. Polish. A Polish school. Okay. So he had very limited education, yet he's, he throws himself into this world, first of journalism, 
uh, and you know, then into the world of historians, which to me seems absolutely amazing and, and you know, really reflects on a character who you know, must certainly be brilliant. Yeah, and dedicated. Um, but I also think, Eddie, it says a lot about how different the world was then yeah. than it is now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't think at that time, um, anyone from that poor, or now, anyone from that poor background could, would b become an academic. But he wasn't trying to become an academic. He was trying to become part of a Jewish intelligentsia that was in, in a moment of broadening. Yeah. It was like there was a, because of all of the circumstances of the interwar period, somehow, and especially because of left-wing political movements, there was this kind of space opening for people who traditionally would never have been able to be intellectuals to become writers or journalists. And it was a very brief opening, but we, we, we see it for sure in Poland and, and we see it in Paris where I mean, the reason he could become a journalist was because he was in this political world of anarchists and communists. And it was valued in that world to have a worker's voice. So when he starts writing for the Yiddish press, it is for a communist daily newspaper. And he's reporting on, you know, the shoemakers union and um, the watchmakers. And he's kind of going around the city reporting on what workers' lives were like. And for that, being an authentic worker himself, right, was a plus. So obviously he needed to be very literate and that for that, in a way, it's surprising that someone who quit school at age 15 was able to pull it off. Um, but he was writing at a very basic level because he was writing for readers who were also only minimally educated. And that's really where he gets a start. And one of the sad things that my research, that I found in my research that I had to keep in mind is that in some ways there was more room for people from his background to be intellectuals in that period than there was in America after the war. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, if you look at, you know, the material in Yivo's archives and the, the the people that it represents, it's a whole generation. In fact, it's a it maybe a few generations of people very similar to this, who's, uh, you know, who don't really have formal educations, but wind up as, um, you know, writers, journalists, um, doing all kinds of, you know, sort of literary work, uh, you know, for which they seemingly have no experience. Um, you know, even, you know, the, 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 you know, the occupation Yiddish journalist didn't really exist until the 1890s. You know, it's it's a it's a new phenomenon, and so you know, people, you know, obviously the the explosion of the Yiddish press is all part of this. It allows them to find jobs and work in these environments, and it also allows them at the same time to create a secular Jewish culture that hadn't really existed previously. Uh, so you can understand, you know, people like Tchaikovsky his interest in in you know because he's also part of this movement to create a secular Jewish culture you know, that he's, he's um, very much involved with YIVO and their attempt to, uh, you know, create this kind of Yiddish speaking intelligentsia uh, that he strives to be part of. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's really fascinating. And he, he kind of comes at it in Paris through, as I said, like the organized, you know, communist, Jewish communists who are different from the like non-Jewish communists and they're organized separately. But he does encounter YIVO in Paris and that actually makes a huge difference in his life. Because, um, you know, I'm sure you know, but maybe not everyone listening does, that back, YIVO was founded in 1925 in Vilna, but it was never fully centralized in Vilna. They had offices in many different cities, including right. New York from right, right. They had, they had offices in Warsaw, Berlin, uh, New York, and their, you know, their headquarters were in Vilna. But, uh, you know, the historical section was in Berlin. Uh, there was also a historical section in Warsaw. And, and, you know, New York also uh, did a lot as well. Exactly. And in 1933, the Berlin office, which was headed by Riva and Elias Cherikover, moved to Paris. 
And Tchaikovsky kind of in his being a journalist, man about town, knowing everyone, encountered that historical section of Yivo and was totally captivated. You know, by the time he met the Cherikovers, he was getting pretty disillusioned with Jewish communism, really with the party, um, which had supported a Jewish section for a long time and let Jews organize separately and in their own language. And by the late 1930s, was not was much more ambivalent about that, and with the with the Jews' contribution to the to fighting fascism in Spain, Tchaikovsky just got disgusted with the party. He thought um, the party was going to eat its own and was never going to really address anti-Semitism. So he left the party and encountered this world of Yivo Paris who were mostly historians and sociologists studying the Jewish world. Um, and he thought those people are the ones that really are going to help us face our future. And he actually got a scholarship. So YIVO had kind of a grad program. Right, the Aspiranter um, program. The yeah. Aspiranter program. Yeah. And he was granted a scholarship. He was gonna write basically the equivalent of a PhD thesis in Paris and he was supposed to start on September 1st, 1939. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so obviously, you know, September 1st, 1939, the beginning of World War II, and this clearly changes everything for him. And so what, what happens to him during the war? This is also, you know, very, uh, an incredible part of the story. Yes. So Tchaikovsky is, um, like anyone in his position, which was stateless, um, a stateless Polish Jew living in Paris in, in, in wartime, because on September 2nd, the French de declare war on Germany uh, on behalf of Poland in solidarity with Poland. So he, like everyone else, goes and signs up for the French Foreign Legion. Um, he, all of his Yivo friends who have better connections uh, like the Cherikovers, are able to get out and go to New York, but he stays and fights uh, for the French and is wounded. Um, after he is wounded, the Cherikovers then in New York wind up being able to get him a visa through Marseille, um, and he gets to New York, works, works for YIVO, does that Aspiranto program for one year. Yeah, but and then, he, I'm sorry, doesn't he work, first wind up in a concentration camp? Yes, on the way, his boat is intercepted, right? His boat right. is intercepted and he's in a Vichy, a French concentration camp in Morocco. He gets out, somehow uh, the Cherikovers pull strings for him. He has a dramatic you know, trip to New York, very last minute. He arrives in New York in the fall of 1941, wow. right before the Americans enter, right before it would have been too late to get out. Right. And then at that point, when the Americans enter the war, he really doesn't waste time, signs up for the American army and returns to Europe um, after basic training in Fort Ritchie. Yeah, he's one of the few French Ritchie boys. If you've heard of the Ritchie boys. Right. I've, I've heard that 60 Minutes just had an episode on the Ritchie boys. Yeah, exactly. It's these, you know, Jewish, not entirely Jewish, but most of them were Jewish refugees, most of them German. Um, who went back to do intelligence and translating to help the Allied troops. Tchaikovsky was one of them, as he was one of the French Ritchie boys, uh, but he also spoke Polish and Yiddish, and that really made him very useful. And when he went back with the Americans, he did all of that stuff, but that's really where I trace uh, him becoming an archive thief, because all of that time that he spent there, every spare moment, he hunted for documents. Right, and there were, a lot of documents to be had in uh, in post World War II Europe. Um, you know, obviously, I mean, the, the audience probably isn't familiar with y Yivo's uh, collection um, during World War II. Uh, much of it, much of it was sent uh, to Germany uh, to be to become part of a, an institute uh, for research on the Jewish question, a, a Nazi institute. The, the Vilna materials, right? The Vilna materials, the materials. Yeah, the materials yeah. that were located in Vilna, they were they were uh, plundered by the Nazis. Sent to uh, much of it was much of it was sent to Germany. Another portion of it was buried in the Vilna ghetto by people who were sneaking it out of Yivo. Um, and 
a lot of these the materials that were sent to Germany wound up in an enormous warehouse uh, outside of in Offenbach, uh, which is in Frankfurt. And uh, you know, you part Tchaikovsky's story uh, isn't really part of that, but it's it's uh, but this is part of Yivo's story and how they recovered uh, a portion of their pre-war archives, which was never really expected. Um, but you know, throughout Europe, I think. Uh, you know, first of all, the, the Nazis plundered, you know, everything from art to uh, money to gold to archives. Uh, you know, it's it's really astonishing how much they they took. In fact, the photographs of the Offenbach warehouse look like the Indiana Jones warehouse. It's just absolutely enormous and just filled with with crates of of material, and it was. You know, there there was uh, the monuments men, the art, art, art you know artifacts, fine art, fine arts artifacts and um, archives department of the U.S. Army, whose job it was to find these materials and repatriate them to their countries of origin. Um, in the meantime, you had people working for them. You had sort of random others finding materials and just doing whatever they wanted with it. Uh, and Tchaikovsky fits into that category of, exactly. you know, and, and as a person and as, you know, a person who, you know, had been working with archives before, or at least historical material before, uh, he had some fam familiarity of what was of value. Uh, and so, you know, just give us a sense of what kinds of things he was taking in Germany and, uh, and sort of in the years after the war. Yeah. So, you know, when he was in the U.S. Army, he was concerned with two kinds of things. In the time he spent in France, he was mostly interested in anything uh, that would tell what happened to Jews. Um, and it's for this reason, actually. And by the way, when he took things in that period, um, he wasn't really stealing because most of what everything he took in France was not in an institution, right? Um, but mostly what he was taking were like underground periodicals of the resistance or um, Jewish organizational papers that had been given to him. And he sent all of that stuff to YIVO in New York uh, and an institution that remained his home, you know, for the rest of his life from the right. time he first encountered them in Paris in the late thirties until he died in 1978. In Germany, though, is what you asked about. There, it's a very different kind of thing. There, he was based in Berlin after the German surrender. So in as part of the Allied occupation, he was a translator. And he spent every spare moment going through the bombed out remains of Nazi buildings, looking for papers that would explain the perpetrators. And all that stuff he also sent to Yivo. So this is why Yivo has tremendous collections of stuff, of Nazi stuff, was right. he thought that Jews of the future who would want, to, would want to study this to understand why Jews have been persecuted and to document it. Right, right, absolutely. And so, you know, you have uh, similar situations uh, in Poland uh, and elsewhere. So, uh, you know, I mentioned that uh, you know, people uh, known as the Paper Brigade uh, buried materials from Yivo and, and other related materials in the Vilna Ghetto and dug it up after the war. Uh, so in there, you have all kinds of Nazi, you know, within this all collection, you also have Nazi documents. You have the documents of the Judenrat. Um, and this was collected because they wanted to document uh, what had happened to the Jews uh, in, you know, in order, not just for historical purposes, but hopefully in order to prosecute Nazis after the war. And in fact, some of this material was used uh, uh, for the prosecutions of, of Nazis at, at Nuremberg. Um, you know, at YIVO, and I don't want to get bogged down in YIVO, but uh, you know, there are also things like the Lodge Ghetto Archive, which also contains Nazi documents and documents of the Judenrat and all kinds of uh, you know, artifacts and documents from the Lodge Ghetto, and they were collected by a man whose name was Nachman Zonabend, who was a postman in the Lodge Ghetto, and he knew where everything was. And when uh, 
he survived the ghetto liquidation. And after that, he began to fill suitcases full of material that he would find, uh, and he threw them in a dry well. And when the war ended, he you know, went and got them and then brought them to Yivo. Because Yivo, after, you know, at the end of the war, Yivo was the only place that, that survivors knew about because they had known about it from, from Poland. But you know, this type of thing is happening all over Europe. Uh, and I imagine it's not, it's also happening with, uh, you know, other national archival material. Um, no, it's- uh... Not like this. I mean, and I think it is, you know, going back to what you were saying earlier about the efforts in Jewish culture coming out of Eastern Europe in the earlier part of the 20th century that imbued even ordinary Jews, even non-intellectuals with a sense of the meaning and power and importance of documents and that they should collect and preserve, you know, right. to borrow the famous formulation. And that y Yivo, you know, was founded out of that. Yes, ab absolutely. That was, you know, they had, you know, groups of people who were called Zamlers, collectors, and these were, these were not intellectuals. Uh, you know, Yivo put ads in newspapers saying, you know, preserve Yiddish culture, uh, yeah. you know, send us, you know, and they, you know, they, they Evo, you know, did nominal training of these people. They sent them, you know, pamphlets on how to, what to collect, how to collect, how to treat it. Uh, they sent them, you know, uh, uh, questionnaires that they could ask people. Um, yes, this was a, a whole Jewish movement. Yes. Uh, that, uh, that, you know, understandably in the, in the wake of, of World War II, I think when, you know, people thought that, Jewish life would no longer exist in Europe, that this was a, a way to salvage these materials. Um, Absolutely. And I, can I go back to this yeah, sure. thing, bundle of spite? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I really saw in Tchaikovsky, so Tchaikovsky wrote letters to the to Riva Cherikover during the war. So that's how I know what he was up to and, um, and what he thought about it. And the amount of spite he, feel, he felt at that time for the Germans, understandably, for what they did. His whole family, almost everyone was murdered. Um, but also, the, you know, he really cared about the Jewish people and he was living among the Germans. And this collecting, the mania, I mean, he was sending two to three packages per day in the six months he spent in Berlin to Yivo. Wow. Um, with the Fuhrer, the way he wrote about it in these letters is like with rage, you know, like, um, like, and, and also spite not just towards the Germans, but to a lesser degree towards the allies who he felt confident. I mean, when he was there, this was before the Nuremberg trials. This is when they're just ga gathering evidence and he's speculating, but he thinks from everything he knows about the Americans, there will not be justice for the crimes committed against Jews. And he looked around him and he saw American soldiers cavorting with German women. And he thought, these are not people who are gonna hold these Germans responsible. So I'm gonna take it into my own hands. And even if what I'm doing is illegal, which it was, we have to do this. We have to take everything we can so that we will have an archive from which to study and hold accountable these crimes against the Jews. Right. Um, so we have this picture of this, of this man, Zosia Tchaikovsky, who's doing all this. Um, let's look at some actual pictures of him uh, so we can you know, give people a sense of, uh, of what he looked like and who he was. So what do we have here? So this is really early. This is a Paris picture. And I, I think it's from the late 20s. I think he's a teenager in this picture. Um, you know, full of promise. This is Paris. Yeah. Yeah, he, you know, looks happy. And what's funny, one of the funny, one of the nice things about this photo is from this time period, there aren't a huge number of photographs of people smiling. <laughs> there was always this, there's always the, you know, it's this sort of portraiture tradition where people, you know, make a very stern face when they take a photograph. Um, you know, you had some, you know, earlier on, you had to sit there for a long time so people didn't smile. But this is nice. He looks, you know, he looks like a, you know, a happy, happy guy. Yeah. Um, okay. What's going on here? 
So remember how I said that the world of Jewish communism, Jewish anarchism in Paris in the 20s and 30s opened up new ways of life, new ways of looking at the world. This is taken at a nudist colony that Tchaikovsky and his brothers and lots of their friends frequented in that period. And I think it tells you a lot, you know, um, it, it, Jewish communism in France was really different than in the Soviet Union in the same period. In the Soviet Union, gender roles weren't being questioned. Sexuality was not opening up, you know, it was not like the 1960s. In France, it's something different. Um, in France, there's a lot more of this opening and this like nudist colony um, that, you know, it's, it's one example of how social roles were also being questioned. That's the freedom that allowed this guy from a very poor background to become a journalist. Right. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned his association with anarchists, you know, with anarchists, you know, gender roles are always questioned. Uh, you know, this had, this had been going on, you know, for 30 years already. Uh, right. It was, it was really, it was really part of the culture. And, you know, you can find, you know, articles by Emma Goldman in 19, 1907, 1908 about free love. And it was very, you know, very common theme. Um, so, you know, I have to ask, you know, were there a lot of Jewish nudist colonies or was this actually a Jewish nudist colony? It wasn't just Jewish. So, you know, one of the things I found out, so Tchaikovsky is one of his older brothers who was in Paris, had actually spent a lot of time, speaking of Emma Goldman, had spent a bunch of time in Chicago before coming to um, Paris and was from that kind of anarchist scene. And they were the ones who brought Tchaikovsky to this nudist camp. And it wasn't just Jews there, because I know that during the war, one of the reasons that the that some of these family members survived was they were hidden in the area around this nudist camp with Gentiles who they had befriended through this uh, through these networks. Right, but one imagines that, you know, he he's speaking Yiddish in this place. Absolutely, right? <laughs> there were so many Polish Jews in Paris who spoke Yiddish. It was, it was a really thriving subculture, much like what we had in New York. Right, right, all right. This is what you wear if you're in the French Foreign Legion. This is his official photo that he sent to his friends in New York. I've signed up for the war. Okay. He looks well fed. Yeah, that must be the beginning before the war started. Right. Yeah. Okay, I don't know how good your German is, Eddie. Um. So this says that the experiences of history tell us that Hitler's come and go, but the German people and the German nation remain. And this is a quote from Stalin. It's a quote from Stalin. And- Somewhat ironic. Tchaikovsky standing with a gun in front of this, um, in front of this sign as the occupying army. I just wonder what he thought of the Soviet occupation, the American occupation of Germany. And knowing that his concern was the question of whether there would be justice, whether this would be really any different for the Jews. You know, he didn't know yet about Auschwitz, but he knew that it was, uh, that many, many Jews had been killed. And, you know, the German people and the German nation live on even without Hitler. I, you know, like many Jews in this period, to me, this helps explain why he didn't trust the allies and wanted to take things for himself and for the Jewish people. Right. Yeah, that, ma that makes that really makes quite a lot of sense, uh, you know, especially with regard to the Soviets uh, who, um, you know, in regard to Evo, I, I mentioned earlier that the paper brigade uh, had hidden this material in the uh, under the under the Vilna ghetto. And um, it was exhumed after the war, and a small Jewish museum was started by uh, Avram Sutzkever and Shmerke Kaczerginski, who were two poets who were part of this paper brigade. And uh, very shortly thereafter, they realized that the Soviets were not interested in the existence of a Jewish museum, so they began to smuggle these materials out. Uh, they began to give materials to friends who were emigrating to the West, and they eventually smuggled out as much as they could uh, and, and brought it to Yivo in New York. 
uh, because that's where you brought these things. Uh, and so that's just another segment of, of Evo's pre-war archives that, um, uh, that wound up in New York. But it also speaks to the fact that, uh, you know, at some point the Jews realized they couldn't trust the Soviets. Uh, they couldn't trust, you know, the, the, the rest of the allies to, you know, properly prosecute uh, the Germans. And, um, you know, Jewish culture had been decimated. So yes, he's doing what you, you see, you begin to see why he's doing whatever he can to, uh, you know, to, to, to salvage these, these archives and documents. Absolutely. And so here's another salvage picture, picture from Berlin. Um, if you're gonna, this is on the cover of my book. If you're gonna ask me, what is that head? <laughs> and is that a riding crop? I just always show this picture because I'm hoping that someday someone in the Q and A is gonna be able to identify what exactly that is. I, I think it's like a fishing pole. You, th you don't think that's a, some kind of military, the be. kinds of things in his letters that he salvaged and sent to people at Evo, it's amazing. It's not just his parachute from the army, but also like antlers that he took from Goering's hunting lodge and a pistol that he found from some, you know, big high up Nazi. Yeah, actually, I've held that pistol. No. <laughs> yeah, it's in the archives. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know, so these are also things that Tchaikovsky salvaged and one wonders exactly what they are. I think of trophies, you know, back to those Soviet, there were lots of Jews among the Soviet um, army occupying Berlin and Tchaikovsky hung out with them. Right. And they did all sorts of looting, really. We have yeah. to call it looting yeah, in yeah. a spiteful way. It, um, and I imagine that that was part of what was motivating him as well. But it's all, as you say, in the context of when he would send things back home, he wasn't treated like a thief, he was treated like a hero. Yeah. And it's really only after the war that when he keeps stealing in the 1950s um, on his trips back to Europe, that's when he really departs from the norm. During the war, it's something that it was, was really respected. Right, yeah, that it stands to reason. Um, and what's interesting about this photograph is it, it, it's very resonant of a photograph that we have at Evo of Avram Sutzgiver uh, with a big cart of materials that he's bringing from the bunkers that they were buried in in the ghetto uh, to this new Jewish museum. And sitting in this crate is a big bust. Um, and so it's it's just, Right. It's, it's very resonant of like saving these similar materials. And, and just to be really, you know, very specific to Tchaikovsky, in 1945, he knows he has to go home and he does not have a job and he does not have a family. And he is doing everything he can to impress people at Evo in the hopes that after the war, he would have a position there. And it worked. Yeah, no, it, 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 it was a good plan. Well, this is Berlin. This is the kind of thing that not only did he salvage materials from buildings like this, but he took pictures of himself doing it and right. sent them home, right? So this is not a thief trying to cover up what he did. Just like I was saying, he was proud of it. So not only did he send the documents, he, sent a, he documented himself as an archive salvager. Okay, but now this is a photo from after the war. This is actually Tchaikovsky's wedding. Um, his wedding, maybe not the wedding itself, but the reception. Um, when he, it, actually in the early 1950s, when he was picking himself up, he had decided to settle in New York, made a return trip to Paris and France to do some research because he wanted to be a historian and reestablish himself. And I love this picture because there's something so hopeful and future looking about it. His wife was also a refugee, right? Her name is Hannah Gitterman. She was the daughter of Isaac Gitterman who was uh, uh, the JDC representative in the Warsaw Ghetto. He was a historian. 
He was also affiliated with Evo, and he was actually related to the Schneerson dynasty. Oh. Um, she's a cousin of Menachem Mendel Schneerson. She's also a cousin of Yitzhak Schneerson, who founded the um, CDJC, the Holocaust Museum and Archive in Paris. And that, he is a rabbi and he married them. Right, and I think that's the, I would say that it, it's, this is something different, sorry. I thought it was yeah. the next photo, but. Uh... Yeah, so I mean, all of this is from the same time and period where what was going on in his life when these pictures were being taken was, he was hoping to establish himself as a historian. This was going to be the fruition of all of his efforts um, during the war to impress Yivo because he's a rescuer. He's gonna work on these materials and write books. He's going to be the intellectual he always dreamed of. And unfortunately in the United States in the post-war Jewish world and general world, there wasn't a lot of room for a Jewish historian who left high school at the age of 15, who really could only work in Yiddish or was trying to transition over and wanted to work on Jews. There were practically no Jewish studies positions anywhere, even right. if he had gotten a PhD. Right, it was really not much of a field at that time. No, and he is faced with a dilemma, right? Yivo's not paying huge wages. It's not gonna be a great path. He's a frustrated intellectual. And instead of giving up, he instead decides to make it work by stealing from the archives, selling what he's taken. And he knows all these people who work in various Jewish research collections in America who are willing to buy from him. And that's what he does in the 50s. He's selling in the 60s and he's even selling into the 70s. Right. Um, but in addition to that, he's producing scholarship, which is amazing. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, on the one hand, you have this, you know, he's got this incredible st backstory, uh, you know, he's, he's, you know, had this sort of incredibly difficult life. And he's, you know, sort of managed to figure out ways to escape from, from dangerous situations. Uh, and he returns to the United States. Uh, and he begins this, you know, career not just with Evo, but as an independent scholar. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but an independent scholar who is respected, uh, who, who does you know, quality work um, using the materials that he's stolen, yeah. uh, which is also amazing to me. Uh, you know, I think today you couldn't get away with that. Um, but you know, like you said, you know, this earlier period provides an opening for certain people to do certain things. Uh, and, and, you know, this allowed him to, uh, to engage with, with scholarship, you know, on sort of really on his own terms. Um, and Absolutely. And also um, in terms of, you know, obviously it was worse back when Jewish studies wasn't considered worthy of being part of most universities. There were only a few positions. And he was not in a, he was not, you know, would, would never have gotten one of those positions as a modern Jewish historian who, you know, didn't know rabbinics or anything like that. Um, so obviously we don't want to go back to those days, but it did leave open space for people at different, coming at this from different points of view to be valued. You know, um, Salo Baron, who at that time held the chair in Jewish history at Columbia, one of the few positions. Baron was famous for never citing other scholars in his work. And, you know, people would like, were desperate to be cited by Baron. Tchaikovsky is one of the few people who was cited in Baron's work. Baron really valued Tchaikovsky because Tchaikovsky was one of the few doing social and economic history. It was very hard to do anything but studies of like great texts, you know, rabbinical responses, stuff like that, because th those were the sources that existed in America. Tchaikovsky had, because of his willingness to break the law and go to France and steal things, access to sources that gave a window into the lives of more ordinary Jews um, and social and economic history. And people were so thirsty for that. 
And that's what Beren wanted to do. So it, I think that's part of why the archives bought from him. And it's part of why he was, he was, you know, he was elected a member of the American Academy for Jewish Research, the most, at that time, very elite, very esteemed group of scholars. He's the only person in the group without a PhD. That's um, yeah. I, that's amazing, but it also, you know, it, it doesn't just speak to his brilliance, but it also speaks to his, to where he came from, uh, where, you know, he grew up, you know, learning Hebrew from traditional sources, speaking Yiddish, knowing French, uh, you know, I assume he also knew German, um, you know, probably knew oh, Russian. Russian. Yeah, I mean, you know, th th that was sort of standard fare uh, for, you know, intellectuals, or as they call them in Russian, half intellectuals, you know, people without PhDs, um, but, you know, people who could do scholarly work in, a mul you know, in multiple languages, uh, you know, they were clearly very highly regarded. And in America, uh, really at that point, somewhat of a rarity. Uh, you know, you, you just didn't have, you know, in front of, you know, someone, someone from Poland once told me that in America, you, uh, in, in order to know a second language, you have to have a PhD. Um, exactly. It isn't exactly true, but it, but it to I mean, a large degree. You know, but back to where we started, which was that quote of Tchaikovsky being a bundle of spite in the 1970s, Imagining this guy with this background and these aspirations and all of these disappointments yeah. and very serious ethical, you know, bad ethical choices turned to a life of crime sitting in YIVO. And here comes in all these youngsters getting PhDs at universities who don't even know Jewish language as well, or if they do, it's because they were so, they were privileged. And, you know, what is he to make of them? You know, on the one hand, it's great that Jewish studies was coming of age and there was gonna be they, PhDs at universities and positions. On the other hand, what do these people know, right? Of the Jews, what do they know? Right, what could they, you know, they couldn't know what he lived. Yeah. I think that that's, that's sort of the main thing. Um, so what, uh, what, what happens to Tchaikovsky? You mean the end? Yeah. You sort of lead us into, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what eventually occurs. Yeah. So he became an archive thief and in, and he sold to all of the Jewish research institutions, uh, that would buy. And in 1978, in September, he got caught stealing in a, organized police sting because they suspected he was doing it at the New York Public Library in their Judaica division. Um, and a few days later, when it was clear that he was going to be prosecuted, that they had airtight evidence, and that he would therefore lose everything, um, he committed suicide. Yeah, it's a, it's a tragic end. It's a tragic end. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, the story itself is just so incredibly fascinating. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, I saw, I looked at your bibli a bibliography of yours, um, of your own work. And yeah. up and up until, well, I looked at Rambi. Um, and up until you wrote this book, all, all of your work, it seems, is on 19th century French Jewry. So I wanted to ask how, I mean, I, I assume that you somehow stumbled onto Tchaikovsky during your travels in 19th century French Jewry. Uh, so, you know, tell me how this came to be because that, I think that's also, you know, part of this. Yeah, absolutely. So I still consider, I mean, this is a book about obviously the time period that Tchaikovsky lived in, but it's also a 19th century, history book. It's a, how do we understand 19th century Jews in France? Um, which is really what I, you know, live and breathe the most. And at a certain point, I realized everything that I know and study and say about that period is from what is essentially Tchaikovsky's filing cabinet. Because all the sources that I use the most were touched by him 
There are things that he stole and sold. And there's also his, the many subjects that he wrote about 200 articles and books that have so shaped the field that I got interested in that lens. What shaped that lens? Because the questions at the heart of that, Jews in 19th century France are, you know, what Jacob Katz called the contract with modernity. Did we give up too much when we became citizens? What did that mean for Jews of different social statuses? What did it mean for elite Jews? What did it mean for poor Jews? Was it different? Um, and Tchaikovsky's preoccupation with those questions came from his lived experience of the crisis of that. And I think all of his scholarship and his work as an archive thief is an attempt to answer those questions in a more complicated way. So it's like, I, I mean, it's so meta, Eddie, it's so like, but I was interested in this book. How does the 20th century shape what we can even say about the 19th century? And how do those preoccupations, you know, enable us to ask certain questions, but also maybe close off other ones, you know? Well, it's, it's amazing. So then, you know, you obviously had almost had no choice but to write about, write the story of Tchaikovsky. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great. It's great. It's, you know what, and obviously, I, you know, I think, I don't know if, if people in the audience have, you know, how many of them have worked in an archive uh, or have done, you know, some level of academic research, but one, at least for me, one of the joys of doing this kind of research is accidentally stumbling into something else and finding it thrilling and following it up you might have to finish a dissertation or a book before then, but you know you sort of put it aside and say, wow, this is an amazing story. I have to, you know, I have to work on this. And that's, that it appears that that's what happened. That happened. Here. <laughs> Great, it's fantastic. Um, all right, so I wanna take some questions uh, from the audience uh, and I'm hoping, let's see, I'm hoping that, um, Ari curated these, I think he did. Um, so this, uh, one of the first questions is from, is uh, why haven't the, uh, the documents been returned to the original libraries? Great question, important question. Um, when I started this project, my friends who work in archives in France that were looted definitely would have liked for me to make a list of everything that Tchaikovsky stole with proof so that they could go to the, um, to, you know, the French authorities and demand it back. That was not possible. There are not archives, it turns out, do not keep records that could serve as that kind of conclusive proof of what came from Tchaikovsky. Um, so I had to use other methods that work for the historian and that from which I could generalize, but I didn't produce documentary proof of the kind that could lead to those um, kinds of proceedings. But second, the world of Jewish archives is small and let's just say it's not over-resourced, right? Every one of these collections that either had stuff stolen or acquired materials that really came from somewhere else, I'm not talking about the wartime materials, um, but other things that were property of some other institution, none of them have so much in the way of resources that it really makes sense to fight over the originals. And what instead these institutions have turned their efforts to doing is to making copies for each other and even now digitizing collections so that we can see them together. And I think that's the best use of our resources, not to try to undo um, what has been done, but rather to try to reunite them digitally so that we can study them from everywhere. Right, right. And um, YIVO has an enormous project, um, the Vilna Collections Project, uh, that um, you know, I mentioned that all of this material that got buried in the Vilna ghetto during, during World War II, uh, it was exhumed and then much of it was sent to New York by Sutskever and Kaczyginski, but then a huge portion of it remained. They couldn't, and they, they had to escape from the Soviet Union. And so a huge portion of it remained. It was found by a Lithuanian librarian who wasn't Jewish, and he hid it in the basement of a church that became the Lithuanian book chamber. 
uh, and it was not revealed that Yivo's archives and books were in this church until I think 1989, until the Soviet Union started to collapse. And you know, they called Yivo and said, "We found, you know, a, a huge cache of your materials. Um, you know, can you send someone to figure out what it is?" So a delegation from Yivo went. Uh, and, you know, they were just astonished. It was Yivo materials in their original folders and their original boxes. Um, there were letters uh, written to Yivo in New York where the, the, the response was like, the, the, you know, the original letter was in New York and the response was in Vilna. And it really put together, you know, this collection and now it's all being reunited online. And, you know, that's generally what's happening with these other materials is that this you know, digitization technology has made it possible to you know, reunite all of this material and, and make it easier for scholars to, uh, to mine it for, uh, you know, for her historical research. Yeah. It's really, you know, it, it's amazing. Um, all right. Uh, there's a question here. Who are the historians with whom Tchaikovsky came into contact with in France in the 1930s? Uh, obviously the Cherikovers, but I'm sure there were others. Um, was he in any way related to the uh, Annales School? Oh, great, great question. Um, it really was, the historians that he came into contact with in the 30s in Paris were not, I spent far too much time trying to see if he ever like attended the Sorbonne, no. It was the, it was the Yiddish speaking world around the Cherikovers that wasn't just historians, there were also um, sociologists and other, you know, they had like basically a salon out of their apartment and that's where Tchaikovsky was based. And there were, the studies that people were doing were like, um, you know, who attends Jewish summer camps in Paris in the twenties and thirties. Tchaikovsky was doing a project on Jewish immigrants from Poland to France in the 19th century. They were interested in the, their own subculture and its history. Um, so it's, and they were publishing in Yiddish in Yivo's publications out of Vilna. It was a kind of international scene. Was he connected to the Annal School in the 1950s? That's a great question. So those are the economic and social historians in France. And remember I said earlier that he was respected among Jewish historians in America, that he was able to do that kind of work. He definitely encountered those people in the archives in France. Um, and what he saw made him so envious he could barely stand it and even wrote into his footnotes, I wish I had those resources. They were going around in giant teams, breaking apart their projects so that they could do that detailed work that social and economic historians need to do. And he said, I'm only a man of one, I'm a team of one. I can never do that large scale work. So I can only do piecemeal. And that also speaks to the financial situation he was in, right? The Annal School was state funded. He was just a guy who didn't even have a job. Right. Um, I think we have, we'll take one last question. I think we're going over time, but it's okay. Um, someone asked if you can give examples of some of the documents that were taken. Uh, and I think you have a few. Yeah, I was going to say that's a great opportunity to show you even though we're over time. Um, this is a document that is in Cincinnati at Hebrew Union College. It's an 18th century inventory from Alsace. And I know that he took this, that question of how do we know? I know that he took this because his Giddish stamp is on the top of the left hand, the page that's on the left hand side of your screen, Zion Tchaikovsky. Here's another example of a document that's at JTS in New York. And you can see there's a square cut in the top right, again, indicating that maybe it's of questionable origin. What is this? This is also from Alsace. It is a bilingual, document from 1790, the time of the French Revolution, um, a document from, you know, about, about what was happening to Jews in the revolution. Um, so those are some, and maybe I'll just show you, this is from the, the this is um, a, a draft letter 
from the consistory, the, the main synagogue in Paris. So that's the kind of stuff he was taking. It wasn't, you know, medieval illuminated manuscripts. It wasn't things that are valuable in themselves like works of art. Um, it was documents that historians use when they do modern history of the revolutionary period, 18th century and 19th century that tell us about ordinary Jews lives. These pieces were not, you know, he was selling them for $5 each. And when I've been able to find receipts, it's wow. $5 a document, really small potatoes. Yeah. But they tell us, you know, this is what we use, the, the, what, what's in the back of a synagogue. Um, basically, that, that's the bulk of it, um, right. ordinary documents from Jewish life. Oh, really interesting. All right, so unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, so thank you so much. This was really a great conversation. Um, uh, thanks to the Museum of Jewish Heritage for hosting. Uh, and I suggest to the audience that uh, you go out and buy the book. It's not just a riveting story of a really fascinating character in Jewish life, uh, but it is an amazing work of historical research and sleuthing. Uh, you know, I think Lisa Leff isn't just a professor, she's a detective. Uh, so uh, thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Eddie. I thank you both so much on behalf of the museum for being here. And uh, it was terrific to listen to your fascinating discussion. I, I agree with you, Eddie, that I, I think the audience should buy the book. Uh, in addition to thinking about Tchaikovsky's story, I think this is also a, I mean, we should each, when we read history, think a little bit more deeply about how that history is written and, and where it comes from. And when any of us had the opportunity to interact with archives, think about how, how the documents were seen ended up on those archives. There's so much in this story to, to take with us. So uh, we really appreciate it. We're also grateful to SNCF America for the generous support of our programming at the museum. And we're grateful to all of you, the audience for joining us today. I will mention as a brief aside, because the Ritchie boys came up, um, both the UK and the US had these special military units made up of Jewish refugees who had fled Nazism. And tomorrow we are hosting Dr. Leah Garrett for a program about the British military unit made up of Jewish refugees. It's called X Troop. She has a new book coming out tomorrow called X Troop. Um, so uh, we hope you'll join us for that program if, you, if, you, if it sounds interesting to you. We also hope those of you who can will support our, our work at the museum, which is all made possible through donor support. So big thanks to, to you, Eddie, to you, Lisa, uh, and we wish everyone a great afternoon. Take care.